Hey, Ginger here, and I need your help. Help us shape the podcast by filling out our first listener survey. It only takes 10 minutes and it will tell us more about why you listen and how we can grow our audience so that more people learn about the important and interesting research Australia's social scientists are doing. It's so easy. Just follow the link in the show notes or find us on social media where the survey will be pinned as a post. Thank you in advance for helping us promote the social sciences. Now, on to the show. Well, where we are right now is we're in the room in which the Prime Ministers of the day used to sit. So this is where my boss sat when I worked for Whitlam. When you walk into the Museum of Australian Democracy at Old Parliament House in Canberra, you're reminded of the incredible people who came before you, 16 Prime Ministers and hundreds of MPs, but also the thousands of people who worked behind the scenes, out of the spotlight, to help shape and grow Australia. One of those people was Elizabeth Reid, a key figure of the women's liberation movement, adept at demanding change through protest and advocacy. In 1973, she became the world's first advisor on women's affairs to a head of government and started to drive change from within. Old Parliament House to me is a very important building. It's a building unlike New Parliament House, which fosters friendship and it minimises conflict and confrontation. And it was a building where you had a huge number of cross-party friendships. And you'd often see somebody sitting in the dining room with one or two members of the opposition. This was the essence of democracy, this building. The people could come in and come out in a way that is very difficult to do. In the new Parliament House, it's almost impossible. It's huge and you're only allowed in certain places and so on. And in Australia, I think over the last couple of decades, we've been backsliding in our democratic traditions. And I think this is a very good reminder that we once had sets of values that are very different from those we've been living in recent decades. It's true that the current Parliament House in Canberra is a behemoth. It has kilometres of corridors and a ministerial wing that segregates those with the most power from the backbenches, crossbenches and opposition. By contrast, when you enter Old Parliament House, It has a much warmer and inviting feeling. You enter into King's Hall, which was both a public space and a thoroughfare for MPs and their staff walking from the chambers to the library or to get a bite to eat. This office was somewhere where you didn't just come in and out. Mr Whitlam's secretary was most of the time Caroline Summerhays, who lived just outside there. If you wanted to to transact some business with, with Whitlam, you go to Caroline first and say, is this a good time to go in there? And she'd say, oh, stay away. He's in a foul mood. <laughs> or, yes, sleep in. He's in a good mood. And once you are in, you were welcomed. And uh, there used to be a, a lounge there with a table in front of it, and he would sit there with you on the lounge and you could talk things through. This is Seriously Social, I'm Ginger Gorman. And to mark our 50th episode, and also 50 years since Gough Whitlam was elected, I've sat down with Elizabeth Reid, a national treasurer and a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia, to talk about fighting for change and making it happen. I think the relevant phrase that we want to start with here is my experience, and that is the experience of a woman. Because there are many cultures in the world where women, there's no public space where they can speak out. So 
they can't even become part of a culture of advocacy. And then there are many other countries or places in which women can speak, but they're not listened to. They're not heard. So to have a culture of advocacy, you have to have immense respect for women and women's voices. Otherwise, you have public spaces in which only men feel entitled and empowered to speak with him. And that's part of what we were objecting to, I think, with, with the women's liberation movement. We wanted our voices to be heard. We wanted what we were saying to be listened to. We wanted, uh, we wanted, we were demanding, in fact, that, that, that public spaces become spaces where our voices and our concerns were, were addressed. You were appointed in 1973 by the Whitlam government as the world's first advisor on women's affairs. And I noticed in the movie Brazen Hussies, yes. you said not that you felt this deep passion or that was what you always wanted to do. You felt an obligation to apply for that role. Can you explain that to me? It was almost as if advocacy pushed you. By the time Whitlam advertised this job, I had been through one of the toughest schools, training schools for advocacy and protest that existed then and which no longer exists now, and that is the university environment. So in university you learned how to run meetings, how to debate a position, how to organise protests, how to act on a protest, how to make signs for a protest. We didn't have call flutes. <laughs> we didn't pay $200 each call flute. We went and made the signs. And that was all learnt. So university became a training ground for protests, NGOs also. But then with Howard, when with the abolition of SRC fees, when they were no longer mandatory, all that, that aspect of university life got replaced by neoliberal values. SRCs were students' representative councils that represented undergraduates on university campuses. They were run by students for students. And while they were based on similar models from the UK in the 1800s, in Australia they began on campus early in the 20th century. You, you went to university to get a job. You went to university to make your way in the world, to get a network of friends who were upwardly mobile. But, but we didn't go to university for those reasons. University was a totally different place. So by the time I applied for that job with Whitlam, I mean, I'd been marching along the streets. I'd been writing why rape and marriage should be a crime. I had been demonstrating. I mean, I'd been through the whole gamut. I, I mean, I think that, that when I look around nowadays, I don't see that same training ground. And I think Australia suffered because of that. Are people born into a culture of advocacy or is it a learned skill? I learned to protest at the knees of my parents. My parents were active reformers. Now they didn't march as I did, but they were involved in the trade union movement, in the reform of the Catholic education system and all sorts of other protests, social movements. Um, and they, they held meetings and planned and strategized. So all that I'd imbibed in my years. What was it like being a young woman full of spirit, having done all these big protests and so forth, and then ending up in this youthful Whitlam government? What was it like? I mean, it was exciting. It was challenging. It was exhilarating. It was like being on a roller coaster. It was quite amazing, I think. I look back on those years and I think heavens above. You know, first of all, I was a member of the Women's Liberation Movement. So I was used to demonstrating, I was used to street theatre, I was used to all those forms of protest and of airing your grievances and of saying what changes you want to occur. And then Whitlam advertised this job. There was a big debate in the women's movement 
over whether it was better to work inside a bureaucracy or whether it was better to stay outside and kick and scream until it changed. And, of course, when Whitlam offered to open the halls of power to the women's liberation movement, he, in effect, called out bluff. At the time, you really got criticised by the press associated with the women's liberation movement. They thought you should be screaming on the streets and that you were, in fact, selling out by going into the bureaucracy to make change. How do you look back on that criticism now? Because you did actually affect a lot of change. Yes. I had worked on the outside. Whitlam advertised his job. And I felt it was a challenge to the women's movement, a challenge to individual pe- women, whether they were going to say, all right, I'm going to go into the halls of power and see what changes I can bring about. Because this opening has never been made before. Never in, in recorded history had a head of government said, well, come on, come in and tell us what needs to be done. So, yes, there was a great deal of criticism in the women's liberation press, but it was over two. One was whether you should go inside or stay outside and kick and scream, and the other was who was I or the person who was to be appoint- appointed? How could any one woman represent the women of Australia in all their diversity? And, of course, I didn't represent the women of Australia at all. Now, that, that, um, that dichotomy or that criticism festered for quite a while. And I guess uh, it's important to say that after I resigned from my Whitlam job, I left Australia. I felt I was a, pl- a refugee from the Australian press seeking asylum elsewhere. And I went to work in, in developing countries on women in development, then on HIV in development. And I didn't come back to Australia until about, until the 2000s. And when I came back, one of the first people to greet me was one of the most vociferous <laughs> of the Sydney <laughs> Women's Liberation people. It says, well, Elizabeth, it's nice to have you back. And I hope all that is buried. We weren't ever attacking you, the person. We were attacking the position. But it's interesting that at the time your colleagues in the Women's Liberation Movement didn't think that you could protest on the outside as well as being on the inside. Well, yes, I think it's important to realise that we had never been on the inside, which isn't to say, of course, there were women in the bureaucracies, but they hadn't gone into the bureaucracy to bring about changes for women. What we did by going into the bureaucracy was to show that the reform versus revolution debate was a false dichotomy. So with Whitlam's blessing, we set out to instill what we called a revolutionary consciousness within Australians. Or you might say we set out to end patriarchy, to destroy sexism, whichever way you want to put it, but we did call it instilling a revolutionary consciousness. And if you think about that time when you first started in the role, how optimistic were you that it'd be easier to make change and get things done from that role as opposed to screaming on the streets with the placards? You know, I think once I got into the job, I didn't think about it at all. It's funny, but I don't think it ever crossed my mind that I mightn't get things done. I think it was... In one sense, it was clear that a lot of things had to be done. We, the Women's Liberation Movement had drawn up lists, Well had drawn up lists, the National Council of Women had drawn up lists of policies that had to be put in place for women. CWA had drawn up lists. Everybody had lists. Australia was overflowing with lists of policies needed for women. But nobody had tackled the question of, well, how do we do it? What are the policies that will bring about the outcomes that we really need? And how do we get those policies in place? So firstly, I I think I didn't have time to think about what changes would, would come about. But I think also, I think I felt I just needed to be adroit. You had to work out 
what you're going to fight for. And we developed a whole theory of that, which we then tabled for International Women's Year. You had to be savvy enough to work the, the halls of power. It's incredible, though, Elizabeth, thinking about that time because I've seen all this footage of you and photographs of you and there's you, yes. very young woman, just completely surrounded by white men in suits. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So that's who you were working with, men, trying to break into this system as the only woman. <laughs> just about. Now, I had gone to school with Caroline Summerhays, who was Whitlam's secretary, so I had a natural ally, and there were other women on Whitlam's staff. But And I worked predominantly for Whitlam. That is important to say. So whilst you had a bloke's culture here in Parliament House, very definitely, and if you look at the picture of Whitlam's cabinet, you see the cabinet room just chock-a-block full of men in suits. But nevertheless, my focus was on getting Whitlam to understand what changes we wanted and to understand that no one change was ever going to be sufficient, didn't matter what it was, that we wanted a change across the board in, all the, in the attitudes of all Australians towards women and of women towards themselves. One of the most extraordinary things that happened when you were in that role is that ordinary women took up protests with their pen. The correspondence was absolutely extreme. And I think I read that Whitlam was the only person getting more letters than you. Yep. Yep. How do you think about that now, that everyday women of all stripes wanted to talk to you? Look, it was Peter Walensky that convinced Goff to create a position for somebody from the women's liberation movement. And Goff agreed. And that, just the mail, the flood of mail itself, bore out the importance of that advice. It was as if a wellspring opened up. It was as if suddenly the women of Australia thought, there's somebody there that will listen to what I have to say. And many of them would say, I've been writing for years and nobody's done anything about it, but at last I feel there's somebody there that you can do something about it. In the first year or so of my job, I just travelled all around Australia listening to women. And I tried to make it as diverse a group of women as I possibly could. And that combined with the male gave me the set of concerns that were really gnawing away at women's spirit and souls. It also enabled me to speak, to somehow reflect into the public spaces around here the voices of women, women's concerns. If women were here, this is what they would be yelling for or talking about or agitating towards. In her first six months in the job, women wrote to Elizabeth Reed about issues large and small that affected their ability to live freely. Single women refused bank loans or mortgages without a male guarantor. Married women temporarily unemployed were not eligible for unemployment benefits. Widows receiving five-eighths of the pension while widowers received full pensions. Commonwealth Secondary School scholarships that could only be signed by the father. Women returning to the country with their husbands from overseas could not fill in their own quarantine and customs declaration. The list goes on and on. How you keep persevering for change when it can often be glacial? Well, yes. I mean, change is a funny and slippery business. Some change can occur just by somebody saying, thou shalt, and it is the case. And so change can be slow or change can be very, very quick. And I don't think you can predict. I think if you compare those days with, say, the recent March for Justice, it arose, I think, because there was such widespread outrage. Whilst we may have been motivated at times by outrage, I think the women's liberation movement was motivated more by 
I mean, everything was wrong in the world around us, just about. Everything was gendered and women were oppressed everywhere. And if you allowed yourself to be outraged about one thing, what what reaction could you have to all the others? The range of issues or the range of changes desired was so enormous that you just ploughed on. If you couldn't go there, you'd go down here. What changes have you made that you are most proud of? Well, I don't think one person affects change. I think change comes about through teamwork at a particular time and through dialogue. So there are changes that I was involved in that I could single out. And so, for example, I talk about developing a revolutionary consciousness, and we did that through the establishment of the Royal Commission on Human Relations. That was so radical, it's still the only one that's ever been held in the world that we know of. That was a groundbreaking and controversial commission. Its terms of references allowed it to inquire broadly into the family and the social, educational, legal and sexual aspects of male and female relationships. It helped change public discussion around families, gender, sexuality and how marriage impacted a woman's role in society. It was the Whitlam government that introduced something as as radical as not singling out women's marital status in the way you address them. Anybody that wanted not to exhibit a marital status in the way they were addressed could use Smith. Uh, We introduced maternity leave to common public service and so on. But then particular policies that, if I hadn't been around, may not have come into existence, but I don't claim to be the originator of them, was childcare. There had been a report tabled in Parliament on preschool. And I point out to Whitlam that this was the only policy that he'd gone to people with that didn't help working women. It only helped those families where the woman didn't need to work and could therefore take children to sessional preschool and that we needed a whole new childcare policy, and he agreed. What's the advantage of working inside a government or inside a big body like you have, like the United Nations, to achieve change? First of all, there are some things that can only be changed from the inside. So the drafting of legislation is an obvious one. But I actually don't think there are any advantages per se. I think whether or not you affect change depends on a range of factors. One would be why you go into a bureaucracy. So, for example, if you go in to bring about feminist objectives, you're not functioning as a bureaucrat. You go in and you go in to speak truth to power. So you must have a sufficiently powerful position to not be trampled into the dust by speaking truth to power. And support, do you think? Because it's very hard to go into big bureaucracies, which are, in your case, patriarchal. Yes. As this one lone person. That's right. That's right. So you have to have networks of support, some of which will be inside that organisation, but many of which will be outside. And that's when the reform and revolution, non-dichotomy, comes into play because... Those who are outside kicking and screaming can make a space broader, wider for public policy. And you can say, look, look, there's obviously a need for change, so let's let's do something about it. If you contrast that with what we've seen quite recently in the news, we've seen lots of protests. You mentioned March for Justice, huge anti-vax protests, many other protests. What do you think the function is of protests like that in modern Australia? I think any protest is about at least two things. One is airing a grievance. But the other essential role of protest is to educate, is to educate the populace about what your grievance is about. 
Thanks for listening to Seriously Social. I'm Ginger Gorman and a special thank you to Elizabeth Reid for letting me take her back to Old Parliament House. That building is now the Museum of Australian Democracy and if you're in Canberra or planning a trip, I really urge you to pay Moad a visit. You can also watch the full interview. There's lots more anecdotes and highlights on the Seriously Social YouTube channel. It has been such a joy to have made 50 episodes of Seriously Social and I hope you'll join me for the next 50. If you enjoyed this episode of Seriously Social and you're looking for more great in-depth chats to stretch your brain, check out Hands Up, the new podcast from the Public Education Foundation. What is the solution to the teaching crisis? How has all the disruption from the COVID-19 pandemic affected kids' learning? Why are students calling for consent education in the curriculum? How should families best engage with schools? Hands Up is a podcast to help families and carers navigate school life. It's for teachers, school leaders and anyone interested in education who wants to dig deeper into the complexities and challenges and the unique advantages of Australia's public education system. We're here because we can't accept the crippling teacher shortages. I've been fighting for the working conditions of teachers, the learning conditions of students and our wages for 40 years. You know, we often joke that we don't have time to even go to the toilet or, or drink water um, and that's a typical day. And I think because a lot of teachers feel like they don't have the time to teach well and when they feel like they're just rushing and not having the time and resources to design lessons properly or to mark students' work properly or to interact with students properly, to build that relationships with them. They're like, this is not what I signed up for. Look out for Hands Up wherever you get your podcasts or visit publiceducationfoundation.org.au forward slash podcast to find out more. Seriously Social is produced by Kim Lester, engineered by Mark Gargledonk, aka Baldy. And this episode was executive produced by Sue White, Bonnie Johnson and Claire McHugh. It's an initiative of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia. Next time on Seriously Social, does sport unite us or divide us? See you then. Thank you.